Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com have more peace visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary downloadable audio rosaries and more make them pray them give them away at rosaryarmy.com previously on jimmy aiken's mysterious world i am certain that on this day my fellow americans expect that on my induction into the presidency i will address them with a candor which the present situation of our people impels. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Farmers find no markets for their produce. And the savings of many years in thousands of families are gone. A host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, this nation is asking for action, and action now. You're listening to episode 146 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the 1934 fascist coup in the United States. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, be sure to stick around to the end of the episode. We'll have your feedback on our recent episode on when the Gospels were written. But first, in 1933, America and the world were in the grips of the Great Depression. It was the worst economic crisis that people had ever seen. One in four Americans had no job and no source of income. People were desperate and willing to try anything to find a solution. They wanted a strong leader who would take strong action and get the country back on its feet. Strong men in other countries, like Italy's Benito Mussolini, seemed to be doing just that, and many admired his fascist government. Some people thought that's just what we needed here in the U.S., and so a shadowy group of businessmen began plotting to take over the government and install an American dictator. So who were they? What was their plan, and how close did they come to succeeding? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, this episode's mystery involves some controversial terms like dictator and fascist, so let's start by defining them. What is a dictator? A dictator was originally a kind of an official during the Roman Republic in the centuries before Christ. The Romans had gotten tired of having a king, and so in the time of Tarquinius Superbus, or Tarquin the Proud, they abolished the monarchy and set up a republic. But they recognized that emergencies could arise that needed the kind of decisive leadership that a king could provide. In other words, there were times when you didn't want endless political debate. The Latin word for to say or to order is dicto. And so a dictator was the man who had the power to say what they were going to do and to give orders. So the Romans occasionally named a man a dictator to deal with a crisis. Still, they didn't want him turning into a king, so they put limits on the office. One of them was that he had to resign once the current crisis was over or after six months, whichever came first. Unfortunately, that system eventually broke down when, in February of 44 BC, Julius Caesar was named Dictator Perpetuo, or Dictator in Perpetuity. That really made some Roman senators unhappy, and Caesar was assassinated the next month. Over time, later governments also had dictators, but the term didn't mean a ruler who was cruel or oppressive. It was simply a man who had been given broad governing powers, 
typically to meet an emergency situation. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that the word automatically came to mean a cruel or oppressive ruler. So, in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, a lot of people in multiple countries wanted to appoint dictators to deal with the economic crisis. One of them was the Italian Prime Minister Benito Mussolini, who had founded the National Fascist Party. All right, let's look at our next term then. What is fascism? Fascism is notoriously hard to define, and in a lot of ways it's become a silly putty word that gets applied to any political group you don't like, especially if you want to portray them as sinister and authoritarian. The term has been given so many definitions that some political scientists have concluded that it's basically just an insult these days and doesn't really have an objective meaning. However, we're dealing with the early 20th century when it did objectively mean something. The term was coined in 1915 by Mussolini, and it comes from the Latin word fascis. This was a kind of ceremonial object in ancient Rome that symbolized the ruler's authority. A fascist was a bundle of sticks, which often had one long rod emerging with an axe head on the top of it. So it looks kind of like an extra thick axe. For Mussolini, the bound rods of a fascist represented the binding together of people in his ideal society to make for a strong state. You might break a single rod, but it's hard to break a bunch of rods that are bound together. And Mussolini's ideal fascist state was collectivist rather than individualistic and was meant to embrace everything in society. One of his slogans was, everything in the state, nothing against the state, nothing outside the state. And since the state embraced the totality of society, it was, to use his words, a totalitarian arrangement. And somehow he meant that in a good way. There was more to Mussolini's ideology than that, but for our purposes in this episode, we'll be using the term fascist to refer to efforts to emulate Mussolini. A person would be a fascist, in our sense, if he thought Mussolini had the right idea and we ought to do something like what he was doing. And what did Mussolini do? As his totalitarian rhetoric would suggest, he wanted to unite all of the sectors of Italian society. He wanted his government to represent everybody, not just one group of people. That meant he wanted to represent both revolutionaries and traditionalists, both the lower class and the upper class. As a result, he sought to draw support from both working class groups like World War I veterans and upper class groups like big businessmen. He thus had an organization known as the Black Shirts, who were largely drawn from former Italian veterans of World War I. And by the way, in World War I, Italy fought on the side of the Allied powers against Germany and its associates. We were on the same team in that war. In World War II, the situation was more complex, with Italy starting out on the side of the Axis powers, but then things shifted in 1943 after the execution of Mussolini. In any event, his black shirts were largely drawn from former veterans who were supposed to help maintain law and order in the streets against socialists, communists, and anarchists. But Mussolini wanted to unite all of Italian society, including the business class. As a result, he coordinated with the corporate leaders to help organize the economy and promote employment and economic growth. In the 1920s, it appeared to many that he was being successful, and many thought he had the right idea. So fascism spread to other countries in Europe, and some in America thought that it should spread to our country too, especially once the Great Depression started. What is a depression? People are more familiar with the term recession. Is there a difference? Yes, but it's not rigorously defined. In economics, a recession is often defined as a period of two or more economic quarters, periods of three months, where the gross domestic product goes down. So if the GDP is down for more than six continuous months, we're in a recession. And that happens fairly frequently. Since 1980, there have been five recessions in the U.S., and they typically last between eight and 18 months. Then the GDP recovers and the economy starts growing again. A depression is something worse than a recession, but it's not as precisely defined. 
One common definition is that you're in a depression if the GDP declines by 10% or more. So it can involve a specific amount that the economy shrinks rather than how long the period of the shrinkage is. There have been only a few depressions in U.S. history, but the biggest and most recent one was known as the Great Depression. And how did it start? The 1920s were a period of prosperity often called the Roaring Twenties. But in 1929, the stock market started to show signs of instability. On September 3rd, the Dow Jones hit a new high of 381 points, a level it would not hit again until 1954, 25 years later. By comparison, the Dow Jones today is typically around 30,000, almost 100 times higher, though a lot of that is due to the inflation that the government causes by printing more and more money. On Thursday, October 24th, the Wall Street market crash began, though it recovered briefly for a couple of days. Then, on Tuesday, October 29th, it crashed again, with stocks losing 12% of their value in an event known as Black Tuesday. The beginnings of the Great Depression were now well and truly underway, and a host of events began to cascade. With the economic contraction setting in, one business after another started closing. People lost their jobs, and unemployment went from around 4% to 25%. So more than one in four Americans were out of work now. That meant they couldn't pay their bills, and so they started defaulting on their mortgages and losing their homes, or if they rented, they started getting kicked out of their apartments. Banks started failing, which caused people to rush to the bank to withdraw all their money lest the bank collapse and leave them penniless. But... As George Bailey explains in It's a Wonderful Life, banks don't have everybody's money in them all the time. They invest it. So when people showed up at the bank, they couldn't get their money. And as the economy contracted, the investments the banks had made went bad. It only made the crisis worse. And so what did the government do in response? The current American president was Herbert Hoover, and he had been sworn into office in March of 1929, a few months before the Great Depression started. He was a Republican, which at the time meant that he was closely identified with big business and Wall Street types, and thus was easy to paint as a villain. Now, today, Democrats are often just as associated with big business types, but this wasn't as much the case in the 1920s. As the Depression started, people were desperate for a change of leadership, and in the 1932 election, they overwhelmingly picked Hoover's Democratic opponent, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the governor of New York, and he promised the American people a new deal. That meant an economic fresh start, sometimes pictured metaphorically as the beginning of a game of cards, where the dealer deals out new cards to each player. That's what new deal means. FDR got 472 electoral votes, while Hoover got only 59, so it was a landslide defeat for the incumbent. This was a major realigning election. Political scientists say that FDR's 1932 election was the beginning of an era known as the Fifth Party System, which saw the Democrats dominating the federal government for decades. All that was in the future, though, and in late 1932, all eyes were on the president-elect and how he would tackle the Great Depression. What did people think he should do? A bunch of them thought he should become a dictator. Already in November, the month of the election, a bunch of people started advocating Roosevelt being given dictatorial powers. These emergency powers would either be granted to him by Congress, or he would just claim them without congressional authorization. Famous American political commentator Walter Lippmann thought that we needed what he called a mild species of dictatorship. Popular entertainer Will Rogers said that FDR should get emergency powers and that, quote, Mussolini could take our country today and put people back to work at the rate of one million per month, close quote. And the liberal Catholic magazine Commonweal said that Roosevelt should use the powers of a virtual dictatorship to reorganize the government. And these were just a few voices among many. Lots of people thought Roosevelt should become an American dictator. And what did Roosevelt think? 
That's what everyone was wondering, and some people were not at all convinced that he was the man for the job. Here's part of a newsreel covering a speech that the president-elect made on February 15th, just over two weeks before he was sworn into office. He was visiting Miami, Florida, and addressing a crowd, including members of the American Legion's Veterans Organization, at a train station. Because for a good many years I used to come down here. I haven't been here for seven years. But on my coming back, I have firmly resolved not to make it the last time. The president-elect finishes his impromptu talk and prepares to drive on to the railway station when... The startled onlookers suddenly realize what has happened. Pandemonium reigns, and the crowd, led by American legionnaires in their glistening helmets, counts of Sassen Zangara. They've got him. The Secret Service man load him on the rear of the car and hustle him away to jail. And now, the heroine, the woman whose courage all the world applauds. She probably saved Mr. Roosevelt's life by deflecting the assassin's aim, Mrs. W.F. Cross of Miami. I knew he was shooting at the president, so my first thought was to get the pistol up in the air so he wouldn't hurt any of the bystanders. So FDR hadn't even been sworn in, and already there was an assassination attempt on his life. Five people were hurt by the gunman, including the mayor of Chicago, who died 19 days later of peritonitis. But the woman in the crowd spotted the gunman and jerked his arm to keep him from hitting the president-elect. Who was this would-be assassin? He was an Italian immigrant and naturalized U.S. citizen named Giuseppe Zangara. He was unrepentant and said, I have the gun in my hand. I kill kings and presidents first and next all capitalists. He was initially sentenced to 80 years, but when the mayor of Chicago died, he was swiftly tried for first-degree murder, he pled guilty, and was sentenced to be electrocuted. He said, You give me electric chair. I know afraid of that chair. You one of capitalists. You is crook man too. Put me in electric chair. I no care. Under Florida law, a condemned man could not share a cell with another man. And there was already a condemned man in the death cell that was available, so prison officials had to designate another cell for such inmates, leading to that area of the prison being called death row. Death row, is, is that the origin of the phrase, death row? Yeah, it, it was this assassination attempt that we just heard that led to the phrase death row. And Zangara wasn't on death row long. He was executed on March 20th, 1933, just over a month after his crime and just over two weeks after the presidential inauguration. Before his electrocution in Old Sparky, the prison's electric chair, his final words were, Viva la Talia! Goodbye to all poor peoples everywhere. Push the button. Go ahead. Push the button. That's my Italian ancestry. <laughs> so what happened to with Roosevelt, though? Did he shed any light on his views regarding being named an American dictator? He did. Roosevelt was sworn in on March 4th, 1933. We heard a bit of his inaugural address at the top of the show. It's the famous, we have nothing to fear but fear itself speech. In the speech, he tries to strike a balance between the dire and the hopeful. He wants to acknowledge just how bad the situation facing the nation was, but he doesn't want to drive people to despair. He blames the crisis on businessmen, calling them stubborn, incompetent, and unscrupulous money changers. And he talks about various measures he wants to pursue to fix the situation. He also uses language that indicates he's not opposed to being given dictatorial powers. First, he suggests treating the economic crisis like a war, like a foreign invasion, with him as the American military leader and the American people as his army. This nation is asking for action, and action now, treating the task as we would treat the emergency of a war. 
If we are to go forward, we must move as a trained and loyal army. We are, I know, ready and willing to submit our lives and our property to such discipline because it makes possible a leadership which aims at the larger good. This I propose to offer. I assume unhesitatingly the leadership of this great army of our people. So he unhesitatingly assumes the leadership of the army of the American people knowing that they will loyally submit their lives and their property to his discipline so that the greater good may be achieved. Then he says that he hopes it can be achieved under our present form of constitutional government with the normal balance of authority between the legislative and executive branches of government. Action to this end is feasible under the form of government which we have inherited from our ancestors. And it is to be hoped that the normal balance of executive and legislative authority may be wholly adequate to meet the unprecedented task before us. But it may be that an unprecedented demand and need for undelayed action may call for temporary departure from that normal balance. So he's willing, if necessary, to depart from the normal balance of authority between the legislative and the executive. That means he's willing to take on emergency powers. And he gets explicit about this. He says that he is planning to give Congress some plans on what he thinks is needed to fix the crisis and that they can also propose plans as long as they're effective ones. But in the event that the national emergency is still critical, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will then confront me. I shall ask Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. So he was willing to ask for dictatorial powers if things didn't go the right way. The first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, later said it was a little terrifying how enthusiastically the crowd responded to the suggestion. And Roosevelt closed in really dramatic terms, speaking about how the American people want discipline and direction under leadership, and they have made him the instrument of those desires, giving him a role which he willingly takes. They have registered a mandate that they want direct, vigorous action. They have asked for discipline and direction under leadership. They have made me the present instrument of their wishes. In the spirit of the gift, I take it. How times have changed. Imagine how it would be received if a modern president like Obama or Trump said that the American people wanted discipline and direction and made him their instrument to give it to them. Much less saying, as he earlier did, that he knows they will loyally submit their lives and their property to his discipline. Roosevelt really does sound like he's warming up to be an early 20th century authoritarian dictator. Was he ever given dictatorial powers? Certainly not formally, though he did gain expansive authority, and some accused him of functioning like a dictator. In particular, his 1937 proposal to pack the Supreme Court with sympathetic judges led many of his critics to accuse him of tyranny, fascism, and dictatorial action, though that plan ended up not going through due to the so-called switch in time that saved nine, which we can talk about in the future. But Roosevelt did implement many plans, and they were not well received by the business community. Among other things, he tended to change his economic policies so that the business community couldn't predict what laws and policies would 
prevail in the future, and that made it hard for them to plan their businesses. In later decades, some economists would argue that FDR's policies were ill-advised and actually worsened the Great Depression and made it longer lasting than it would have been if a consistent set of policies had been in place and they didn't keep changing. That's a subject we'll leave for another time, but one of his most controversial decisions was taking the U.S. off the gold standard. And what's the gold standard? This is the idea that there should be a certain relationship between the value of gold and the value of the dollar. For some time, the idea had been that if you had a paper dollar, it should be worth a certain amount of gold bullion. But if you broke that relationship, the paper dollar could fluctuate wildly in value. FDR wanted to take the U.S. off the gold standard so that more money could be printed without being restrained by the size of the gold supply, so he could get more money into circulation and stimulate the economy. But... If you print money without increasing the goods and services out there in the economy, you effectively devalue that money through the process of inflation. So when the U.S. went off the gold standard, rich people who had a lot of paper dollars were afraid that their wealth might dramatically diminish in its real value. Many thought that the nation should return to the gold standard, and Since Roosevelt was unlikely to do that, it led some of them to wonder whether they should take independent action. They recognized that their own political lobbying wouldn't be enough, and so they started thinking about a new group of people that could give their movement more oomph. Who did they turn to? Well, in Italy, Mussolini had managed to forge an alliance between business interests and working-class World War I veterans, so they wondered whether a similar alliance could be forged in the U.S. And there were lots of unhappy World War I veterans in America. It had been traditional, after each war, to give every U.S. veteran who fought for his country a bonus for service in the form of a small amount of land and cash. But after World War I, each veteran received only a $60 bonus, which is equivalent to about $1,000 today, and they didn't get any land. Many veterans thought that they should receive more, and the veterans organization known as the American Legion was founded in 1919 and argued for a bigger bonus. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge vetoed a bill that would grant them larger bonuses, but the Congress overrode the veto and gave them anyway. But there was a catch. The veterans didn't get their bonuses immediately. Instead, they were given certificates of service that could only be redeemed after 20 years in 1944. That 20-year waiting period was unpopular with veterans, and it became even more unpopular once the Depression started in 1929, with the redemption still 15 years away. Did the veterans do anything to try to speed things up? In 1932, almost 50,000 veterans marched on Washington, D.C., a group of, you know, made up of World War I veterans and their families who called themselves the Bonus Army. They set up tents and some took up residence in unoccupied buildings. Others camped out in a swampy location that came to be called Hooverville after then President Hoover. But the odds were stacked against the Bonus Army. On July 28, 1932, President Hoover ordered the Secretary of War to drive the bonusers out. This led to a confrontation in which the police fired on the protesters and killed two of them. An Army intelligence report that remained classified until 1991 said that the bonusers planned to occupy the capital permanently and start a series of communist uprisings in different cities around the nation. The report even indicated that a good number of the Marines stationed around Washington would side with the bonusers. What did the government do in response? The Secretary of War ordered Chief of Staff General Douglas MacArthur to take action and expel the protesters. However, MacArthur exceeded his orders and even defied later stand-down orders from Hoover, stating that the bonus army was an attempt to overthrow the U.S. government. He had the cavalry charge the Bonus Army and then sent the infantry after them with fixed bayonets and tear gas. After the assault, a woman miscarried and a 12-year-old boy died. 
The Bonus Army was expelled, but there were even more unhappy veterans as a result of the way it was treated. And after FDR was sworn in in 1933, the Wall Street industrialists still hoped to use the veterans against him and his New Deal policies. They just needed to find a leader for all the disgruntled veterans. And who did they approach? A man named Smedley Darlington Butler. He's the man you see in the artwork for this episode. He was born in 1881, and he was 52 years old in 1933. He was born in Pennsylvania to a Quaker family, and they were a bit eccentric. They even referred to each other within the family using old-style these and thous. So young Smedley would say things to his father like, Father, I want to enlist. Thee could get me into the Navy. And his father would say things back like, I have known of thy desire to go to war, but thee is too young. And that's another way in which they were eccentric. Though Quakers are traditionally pacifists, Smedley was jonesing to join the military and fight in the Spanish-American War, which started in 1898 when he was 16 years old. His parents sort of reluctantly ended up supporting him, so he lied about his age and joined the Marine Corps. In the Corps, he covered himself in glory and swiftly rose through the ranks. By the time he retired in 1930, after more than three decades of service, he had reached the rank of Major General, meaning he was a two-star general. He also was the most decorated Marine ever at the time, and had, among other awards, received the Medal of Honor twice, the Medal of Honor being the highest award in the U.S. military. He was extraordinarily popular with the veterans as a result, and just the kind of man that a bunch of disgruntled vets might follow. So the eyes of the Wall Street industrialists turned to him. And how did they make their approach? About July 1st, 1933, just four months after FDR had been sworn in, General Butler received a phone call from Washington, D.C., from a man he knew slightly. The man asked if General Butler would be willing to meet with two fellow veterans if they visited him that afternoon, and he said yes. Five hours later, a chauffeured limousine drove up to his house and two men got out. The first was named Bill Doyle, and he was the commander for the American Legion Veterans Organization in Massachusetts. The second was Gerald McGuire, and he was the former commander for the American Legion in Connecticut. They explained that the American Legion was soon going to be having its convention in Chicago, and they were unhappy with the current leadership of the organization. They felt that the leaders were helping themselves rather than the ordinary veterans who belonged to the organization. And that goes along with science fiction writer Jerry Pornell's Iron Law of Bureaucracy, which states that the bureaucrats always get control of an organization and use it to help themselves rather than furthering the actual purpose of the organization. How did these two men want to fix the situation with the American Legion? They wanted to replace the current leadership of the organization, and they wanted General Butler to help. They wanted him to come to the convention and make a speech. To enable him to come to the convention, they had arranged for him to be appointed a delegate from Hawaii, which was not yet a state, and General Butler didn't even live in Hawaii. Butler was suspicious, but he played along to try to figure out what their real plans were. They came back two or three days later with a modified plan. Now, instead of bringing Butler to the convention as a delegate from Hawaii, they wanted him to get two to three hundred legionnaires to come with him to Chicago on a special train, and he would attend the convention as an ordinary member of the organization, not a delegate. But once there, the men he had brought with him were to get excited and demand that he make an unscheduled public speech at the convention. They even gave him a copy of the speech they wanted him to read. They also offered to pay all the expenses of the two to three hundred men Butler was to bring with him. And to show him that they had the funds to cover these expenses, they showed him a bank book with deposits of $42,000, which would be $840,000 in today's money after all the government-caused inflation. 
This made Butler even more suspicious, but he kept playing along, not really doing anything, but also not giving them a definitive no. When did they contact Butler next? About August 1st, the second of the two men, Gerald McGuire, came back to ask how the plan was going. Butler told him he'd been too busy to see about finding any soldiers to go to the convention. When Butler queried him about the source of the funds, he said that they came from a group of nine men who had donated the money. One of these was McGuire's employer, Colonel Grayson Murphy, a powerful banker in New York City and an associate of the financier J.P. Morgan. On September 1st, Butler was staying in a hotel in Newark, New Jersey, when McGuire came to see him again. He told McGuire that he wouldn't be going to Chicago because he thought they were bluffing and didn't really have any money. After all, all he'd seen at this point was a bank book, and anybody can put any numbers they want in a bank book. So to prove that they had actual cash, McGuire pulled out a roll of 18 $1,000 bills and tossed them on the hotel bed. McGuire told Butler to keep the $18,000, which is equivalent to $360,000 today, and to use it to pay the expenses of the men he'd be taking to Chicago. Butler refused the money and said he would not be taking anybody to Chicago, but he was noncommittal about whether he himself would go. Did Butler try to find out more about who McGuire's superiors were? Yes, he said that he was done speaking with McGuire since he was only a go-between, and he wanted to meet one of the principal men of the organization McGuire represented. McGuire said he'd arrange a meeting with one of his superiors, who was a wealthy banker named R.S. Clark. Clark came to visit Butler the next Sunday and offered to take him to the Chicago convention on his private train car. He also said he'd make sure Butler got to speak at the American Legion convention and asked Butler if he'd been given the speech he was to read. Butler indicated that he had it, and Clark said he paid a lot of money to have the speech written. It was implied that it had been written by John W. Davis, the 1924 Democratic presidential candidate who had lost to Calvin Coolidge. And what was the speech about? The gold standard. They wanted to get Butler to give a speech advocating a return to the standard, which would get the veterans fired up about the idea. That would pressure FDR and his administration to return to the gold standard, and thus each dollar of American currency in circulation would be backed by a certain amount of gold rather than having a free-floating value with respect to the precious metal. Why would the veterans of the American Legion care about that? Well, a lot of people thought it was a good idea. The U.S. had historically backed its currency with precious metals like gold and silver, and the idea of having it untethered from a precious metal was scary, and a lot of people thought the money would lose its value. The way this would be a benefit to the veterans was by telling them that they deserve to have their bonuses paid in dollars backed by gold rather than having their bonuses paid in rubber money. However, Clark admitted to Butler that he also had a personal motive for wanting a return to the gold standard. He said that he had $30 million and that he was willing to spend half of it to get back on the gold standard so that the other half of his fortune would not be devalued. That's how frightened he was of how money might be devalued without the gold standard. It would be worth losing half his fortune to save the other half. Butler felt that this was just rich people trying to use poor people as instruments to save themselves. According to General Butler's sworn testimony before Congress the following year, this is what happened next. Well, I said, I am not going to Chicago. He said, Why not? I said, I do not want to be mixed up in this thing at all. I tell you very frankly, Mr. Clark, I've got one interest, and that is the maintenance of a democracy. That is the only thing. I took an oath to sustain the democracy, and that is what I'm going to do and nothing else. I'm not going to get these soldiers marching around and stirred up over the gold standard. What the hell does a soldier know about the gold standard? You're just working them, using them, just as they've been used right along, and I'm going to be one of those to see that they do not use them any more except to maintain a democracy, and then I'll go out with them any time to do that. He said, Why do you want to be so stubborn? Why do you want to be different from other people? We can take care of you. You have a mortgage on this house. 
waving his hand, pointing to the house. That can all be taken care of. It, it's perfectly legal, perfectly proper. Yes, I said, but I just do not want to do it. That's all. Finally, I said, do you know what you're trying to do? You're trying to bribe me in my own house. You're very polite about it, and I can hardly call it that, but it looks kind of funny to me making that kind of proposition. You come out into the hall. I want to show you something. We went out there. I have all the flags and banners and medals of honor and things of that kind. It's my own place. They've been given me by the Chinese and the Nicaraguans and the Haitians, by the poor people. I said to him, you come out here. Look at what and see what you're trying to do. You're trying to buy me away from my own kind. When you've made up your mind that I will not go with you, then you come and tell me. In a few minutes, he came back to the back office and said, Can I use your telephone? Yes. He called up Chicago and got hold of McGuire at the Palmer House and said to McGuire, General Butler is not coming to the convention. He has given me his reasons, and they are excellent ones, and I apologize to him for my connection with it. I'm not coming either. You can put this thing across. You've got $45,000. You can send those telegrams. You'll have to do it in that way. The general is not coming. I can see why. I'm going to Canada to rest. If you want me, you know where you can find me. You have got enough money to go through with it. That was the end of that, and we talked pleasantly on personal matters after that. I took him to the train about six o'clock, and he went home. The convention came off, and the gold standard was endorsed by the convention. I read about it with a great deal of interest. There was some talk about a flood of telegrams that came in and influenced them, and I was so much amused because it happened right in my room. So despite the fact that Butler didn't go to Chicago, the American Legion ended up endorsing a return to the gold standard anyway, apparently because of telegrams by Mr. McGuire that he sent to influence it. Since General Butler didn't go to Chicago for the American Legion convention, were they done with him now? No, they were still interested. And to understand the next incident, we need to know about another political figure of the day. And we mentioned that the gold standard speech was apparently written by the 1924 Democratic presidential candidate who had lost. Now we need to know about the 1928 Democratic presidential candidate who also lost. His name was Al Smith, and he grew up working class in New York, but rose to become governor of the state before FDR. And he then ran for president in 1928, though he lost to Herbert Hoover. He also was the first Catholic candidate for U.S. president from a major political party. Though there was more anti-Catholic sentiment at the time, and the first Catholic wouldn't win the presidency until John F. Kennedy in 1960. Smith also ran for the Democratic nomination in 1932, but he lost out to FDR, who then went on to become president. And along with Smith's rise in the world, he became wealthy and started associating with the business class. According to Butler's congressional testimony, when he and McGuire met again, McGuire had a new proposal. He proposed that I go to Boston to a soldier's dinner to be given by Massachusetts Governor Ely for the soldiers, and that I was to go with Al Smith. He said, We will have a private car for you on the end of the train and have your picture taken with Governor Smith. You will make a speech at this dinner, and it will be worth $1,000 to you. I said, I never got $1,000 for making a speech. He said, You'll get it this time. Who's going to pay for this dinner and this ride up in the private car? Oh, we will pay for it out of our funds. You will have your picture taken with Governor Smith. I said, I do not want to have my picture taken with Governor Smith. I do not like him. Well, then he can meet you up there. I said, no, there's something wrong in this. There's no connection that I have with Al Smith that we should be riding along together to a soldier's dinner. He's not for the soldiers either. I'm not going to Boston to any dinner given by Governor Ely for the soldiers. If the soldiers of Massachusetts want to give a dinner and want me to come, I will come. But there's no thousand dollars in it. So he said, well, then we'll think of something else. I said, what is the idea of Al Smith in this? Well, he said. Al Smith is getting ready to assault the administration in his magazine, New Outlook. It will appear in a month or so. He is going to take a shot at the money question. He has definitely broken with the president. I was interested to note that about a month later he did, and the New Outlook took the shot that he told me a month before they were going to take. Let me say that this fellow has been able to tell me a month or six weeks ahead of time everything that happened. That made him interesting. 
I wanted to see if he was going to come out right. So I said at the, this time, so I'm going to be dragged in as a sort of publicity agent for Al Smith to get him to sell magazines by having our picture taken on the rear platform of a private car. Is that the idea? Well, you are to sit next to each other at the dinner, and you're both going to make speeches. You will speak for the soldiers without assaulting the administration, because this administration has cut their throats. Al Smith will make a speech, and they will both be very much alike. I said, I'm not going. You just cross that out. So, McGuire had inside knowledge of Al Smith's break with Roosevelt and his plans to blast him in his magazine, which did indeed happen. And since Butler wasn't interested in working with Al Smith, McGuire pitched him a new idea the next time they met, which was in November 1933. At the time, Butler was trying to recruit veterans to stand up for democracy because he thought our democracy was going to be put to a severe test soon, and the veterans had the most stake in maintaining a democratic society because that's what they'd fought for. McGuire said, in essence, Great, can I come too? My associates want to build a super organization of veterans to stand up for our democracy. But Butler didn't trust him and wouldn't have anything to do with him, so he didn't accompany him on his recruiting tour. Then, he didn't hear from McGuire for a time. According to Butler, I never heard of him again until about February 1934, when I had a postcard from Nice down on the Riviera. He said he was having a wonderful time over there. Then I began to get the idea that he was using Clark to pull money out of Clark by frightening him about his $30 million, and then he was coming to me. And then he would go back and tell Clark... I've been to see Butler, and he will go along if you will get me $5,000 more. In other words, I could see him working both ends against the middle and making a sucker out of Clark. However, if Clark wanted to get rid of his money, it was none of my business. I had another short note from him, from Berlin, along in the spring, about April or May. He said he was having a wonderful time. He'd been over there ever since he left me in November. He went over the 1st of December. That's the reason I had not heard anything more of him. Then, in August of 1934, he got a phone call from McGuire, who wanted to meet him in person in Philadelphia, and they met in an empty cafe in the city's Bellevue Hotel. This year, the American Legion was going to be holding its convention in Miami, Florida, and McGuire wanted to know if Butler was planning to go, which he was not. He said, The time has come to get the soldiers together. Yes, I said, I think so too. He said, I went abroad to study the part that the veteran plays in the various setups of the governments that they have abroad. I went to Italy for two or three months and studied the position that the veterans of, the, of Italy occupy in the fascist setup of the government, and I discovered that they are the backbone of Mussolini. They keep them on the payrolls in various ways and keep them contented and happy, and they are his real backbone, the force on which he may depend in case of trouble to sustain him. But that setup would not suit us at all. The soldiers of America would not like that. I then went to Germany to see what Hitler was doing, and his whole strength lies in organizations of soldiers too. But that would not do. I looked into the Russian business. I found that the use of the soldiers over there would never appeal to our men. Then I went to France, and I found exactly the organization we are going to have. It is an organization of super soldiers. He gave me the French name for it, but I don't recall what it is. I never could have pronounced it anyway. But I do know that it is a super organization of members of all the other soldiers' organizations of France, composed of non-commissioned officers and officers. He told me that they had about 500,000, and that each one was a leader of 10 others, so that it gave them 5 million votes. And he said, Now that is our idea here in America, to get up an organization of that kind. And by the way, the name of the organization that Butler couldn't remember was the Croix de Feu, or Cross of Fire. It was a kind of French nationalist organization of elite veterans that some consider fascist, though there's apparently a dispute about that. McGuire wanted to set up a parallel American super soldier organization with half a million members. He told Butler that this organization would support President Roosevelt, which surprised Butler because the last time he met McGuire, he was opposed to the president and his policies. But McGuire said the president would go along with him and his associates now. 
I said, the idea of this great group of soldiers then is sort of frighten him, is it? No, 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 not to frighten him. This is to sustain him when others assault him. He said, you know, the president is weak. He will come right along with us. He was born in this class. He was raised in this class and he will come back. He will run true to form. In the end, he will come around. But we have got to be prepared to sustain him when he does. I said, well, I do not know about that. How would the president explain it? He said, he will not necessarily have to explain it because we are going to help him out. Now, did it ever occur to you that the president is overworked? We might have an assistant president, somebody to take the blame, and if things do not work out, he can drop him. I said, how do you know all this? Oh, he said, we are in with him all the time. We know what's going to happen. He went on to say that it did not take any constitutional change to authorize another cabinet official, somebody to take over the details of the office, take them off the president's shoulders. He mentioned that the position would be a secretary of general affairs, a sort of a super secretary. The name of the new super secretary would be something like the secretary of general affairs or the secretary of general welfare, and he would be the real person running the executive branch of the government, with the president taking on a more ceremonial role. And he said, You know, the American people will swallow that. We've got the newspapers. We will start a campaign that the president's health is failing. Everybody can tell that by looking at him, and the dumb American people will fall for it in a second. And I could see it. They had that sympathy racket that they were going to have somebody take the patronage off of his shoulders and take all the worries and details off of his shoulders, and then he'll be like the president of France. I said, so that's where you got this idea? He said, I have been traveling around, looking around. Now, this super organization, would you be interested in heading it? I said, I am interested in it, but I do not know about heading it. I'm very greatly interested in it because, you know, Jerry, my interest is, my one hobby is maintaining a democracy. If you get these 500,000 soldiers advocating anything smelling of fascism, I'm going to get 500,000 more and lick the hell out of you and we'll have a real war right at home. You know that. Oh, no, I, we do not want that. We want to ease up on the president. Yes, and then you'll put somebody in there you can run. Is that the idea? The president will go around and christen babies and dedicate bridges and kiss children. Mr. Roosevelt will never agree to that himself. Oh, yes, he will. He will agree to that. I said, I don't believe he will. I said, don't you know that this will cost money what you're talking about? He says, yes, we have got $3 million to start with on the line, and we can get $300 million if we need it. So... McGuire's associates already had $3 million and could get up to $300 million if they needed. In today's money, that's equivalent to having $60 million to start with and being able to get up to $6 billion to spend on the plan. The Secretary for General Affairs also would be worked into the line of presidential succession. So if Roosevelt resigned, he could become president. And they wanted General Butler to become the secretary. He said, When I was in Paris, my headquarters were at Morgan and Hodges. We had a meeting over there. I might as well tell you that our group is for you, for the head of this organization. Morgan and Hodges are against you. The J.P. Morgan interests say that you cannot be trusted, that you're too radical, and so forth, that you are too much on the side of the little fellow. You cannot be trusted. They are for Douglas MacArthur as the head of it. Douglas MacArthur's term as Army Chief of Staff expires in November, and if he's not reappointed, it is to be presumed that he will be disappointed and sore, and they are for getting him to head it. I said, I don't think that you'll get the soldiers to follow him, Jerry. He's in a bad odor because he put on a uniform with medals to march down the street in Washington. I know the soldiers. Well, then, we will get former Lieutenant General Hanford McNiter. They want either MacArthur or McNiter. They do not want you. But our group tells them that you are the only fellow in America who can get the soldiers together. They say, yes, but he will get them together and go in the wrong way. That is what they say if you take charge of them. I said, McNider won't do either. He will not get the soldiers to follow him because he's been opposed to the bonus. Yes, but we will have him change. 
And it is interesting to note that three weeks later after this conversation, McKnighter changed and turned around for the bonus. It is interesting to note that. He said, There is going to be a big quarrel over the reappointment of MacArthur. And he said, You watch the president reappoint him. He is going to go right, and if he does not reappoint him, he is going to go left. And now, in November 1934, I've been watching with a great deal of interest this quarrel over his reappointment to see how it comes out. He said, You know as well as I do that MacArthur is Stotesbury's son-in-law in Philadelphia, Morgan's representative in Philadelphia. You just see how it goes, and if I am not telling you the truth... I noticed that McNighter turned around for the bonus and that there's a row over the reappointment of MacArthur. So McGuire indicated that there were different factions among his associates. Those with J.P. Morgan wanted MacArthur to be the new Secretary of General Affairs, but his own faction wanted General Butler, and General McNighter was the fallback. Also, McGuire continued to display inside knowledge of current affairs by not only successfully predicting Al Smith's attack on Roosevelt in the press, he also predicted General McNighter's reversal on the veterans' bonus issue, and he predicted General MacArthur's reappointment controversy. And that wasn't all. I said, what are you going to call this organization? He said, well, I don't know. I said, is there anything stirring about it yet? Yes. He says, you watch. In two or three weeks, you will see it come out in the paper. There will be big fellows in it. This is to be the background of it. These are to be the villagers in the opera. The papers will come out with it. And in about two weeks, the American Liberty League appeared, which was just about what he described it to be. That is the reason I tied it up with this other thing about Al Smith and some of these other people, because of the name that appeared in connection with this Liberty League. So McGuire was right again, and in a couple of weeks, the press was announcing the formation of the American Liberty League. This was a bipartisan, anti-New Deal organization that opposed FDR's policies, which they held infringed on the liberty of Americans' economic rights. It was made up of business and political leaders. The leaders included the 1924 presidential candidate John Davis, who allegedly wrote the gold standard speech, and the 1928 Democratic presidential candidate Al Smith, who blasted Roosevelt in the press. And it included businessman Irene DuPont of the famous DuPont Chemical Company, John Jacob Raskob of General Motors, Alfred P. Sloan of General Motors, J. Howard Pugh of Sun Oil, Hollywood movie producer Hal Roach, and others. Did Butler ever try to get anyone else involved so they could testify to the overall plot? He did. In September of 1934, he contacted Paul Comley French, who was a reporter for the Philadelphia Record and the New York Post. Butler arranged a meeting between French and McGuire, who was initially suspicious of French, but Butler assured him that French was okay. McGuire then met with French at his New York office on September 13th. According to French's later congressional testimony, I have here some direct quotes from him. As soon as I left his office, I got to a typewriter and made a memorandum of everything that he told me. We need a fascist government in this country, he insisted, to save the nation from the communists who want to tear it down and wreck all that we've built in America. The only men who have the patriotism to do it are the soldiers, and Smedley Butler is the ideal leader. He could organize a million men overnight. During the conversation, he told me he had been in Italy and Germany during the summer of 1934 and the spring of 1934 and had made an intensive study of the background of the Nazi and fascist movements and how the veterans had played a part in them. He said he had obtained enough information on the fascist and Nazi movements and of the part played by the veterans to properly set up one in this country. He emphasized throughout his conversation with me that the whole thing was tremendously patriotic that it was saving the nation from communists, and that the men they deal with have that crack-brained idea that the communists are going to take it apart. He said the only safeguard would be the soldiers. At first, he suggested that the general organize this outfit himself and ask a dollar a year dues from everybody. We discussed that, and then he came around to the point of getting outside financial funds. And he said that it would not be any trouble to raise a million dollars. He said that he could go to John W. Davis, 1924 presidential candidate and attorney for J.P. Morgan and Company, or Perkins of the National City Bank, and any number of persons and get it. During my conversation with him, I did not, of course, commit the general to anything. I was just filling him along. 
Later, we discuss the question of arms and equipment, and he suggests that they could be obtained from the Remington Arms Company on credit through the DuPonts. I do not think at that time he mentioned the connections of DuPont with the American Liberty League, but he skirted all around it. That is, I do not think that he mentioned the Liberty League, but he skirted all around the idea that that was the back door and that this was the front door. One of the DuPonts is on the board of directors of the American Liberty League, and they own a controlling interest in the Remington Arms Company. In other words, he suggested that Roosevelt would be in sympathy with us and proposed the idea that Butler would be named as the head of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps by the president as a means of building up this organization. He would then have 300,000 men. Then he said that if that did not work, the general would not have any trouble enlisting 500,000 men. During the course of the conversation, he continually discussed the need of a man on a white horse, as he called it a dictator who would come galloping in on his white horse. He said that was the only way, either through the threat of armed force or the delegation of power, and the use of a group of organized veterans to save the capitalistic system. He warmed up considerably after we got underway, and he said, we might go along with Roosevelt and then do with him what Mussolini did with the King of Italy. It fits in with what he told the general, that we would have a secretary of general affairs, and if Roosevelt played ball, swell and if he did not, they would push him out. He expressed the belief that at least half of the American Legion and the veterans of foreign wars would follow the general if he would announce such a plan. He had a very brilliant solution of the unemployment situation. He said that Roosevelt had muffed it terrifically, but that he had the plan. He had seen it in Europe. It was a plan that Hitler had used in putting all of the unemployed in labor camps, or barracks, in forced labor. That would solve it overnight, and he said that when they got into power, That is what they would do, that that was the ideal plan. He had another suggestion to register all persons all over the country, like they do in Europe. He said that would stop a lot of these communist agitators who were running around the country. He said that a crash was inevitable and was due to come when bonds reach 5%. He said that the soldiers must prepare to save the nation. So a real fascist dictatorship here in America, modeled on what was being done by Mussolini and Hitler, and backed by industrialists and business leaders like the Morgans and the DuPonts and former presidential candidates. But since the business leaders were the moving powers behind it, the conspiracy has become known as the business plot. All right. Wow. <laughs> That's quite quite a beginning to this episode. Uh, we're going to, in a second, get into our theories and our faith and reason perspectives. But before we do, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Kathleen R., Kathleen O., Martin P., Jonathan B., and Deborah F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. Now's a great time to become a StarQuest patron, thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter. When you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor to support all our shows, including this one, making your gift go even further. And we're more than halfway to our goal of $2,000 in new monthly pledges. Won't you help us close this gap? If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now's the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com. Have more peace. Visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the business plot? The basic question is how real all of this was. Could it have been completely unreal, just something that Smedley Butler imagined or hoaxed? Could it have been partially real, with McGuire talking it up to scam money out of rich men, but with no real intent of going through with it? Or could it have been a genuine plot led by business leaders who were earnest about it? Also, we need to look briefly at it from the faith perspective, and we need to look at what happened in the end. So what can we say about the business plot from the faith perspective? 
We last talked about a coup in episode 113 on the 1945 Kujo incident right at the end of World War II when there was a coup against the Emperor of Japan to keep the war going. In that episode, we noted that the Catechism of the Catholic Church lays out the conditions for taking up arms against the political authorities. Now, you have to be willing to take up arms if you're going to pull off a coup, even if you're trying to do it bloodlessly just by intimidating the government with your 500,000-man veterans organization armed with guns from the Remington Arms Company. The business plot leaders would still have to be willing to go forward with violence if President Roosevelt wasn't willing to go along with them. So here's what paragraph 2243 of the Catechism says. Armed resistance to oppression by political authority is not legitimate unless all the following conditions are met. 1. There is certain, grave, and prolonged violation of fundamental rights. 2. All other means of redress have been exhausted. 3. Such resistance will not provoke worse disorders. 4. There is well-founded hope of success. And 5. It is impossible reasonably to foresee any better solution. The leaders of the business plot may have felt that those conditions were fulfilled and that armed resistance was justified. In fairness to their cause, it has been argued that FDR's policies severely harmed the country and extended the Great Depression by seven years. However, the business leaders were wrong about other things, like the idea that a return to the gold standard was essential. Many people today argue that it would be better if we were on the gold standard, and they might be right. I don't have a strong opinion on that. But the U.S. has built the largest economy in the world, despite the fact we're not on the gold standard. What's your conclusion about the moral aspects of the business plot? I wasn't alive back in 1933, and I'm not an expert on all the relevant factors that applied at the time. However, while anti-New Deal business leaders had some legitimate points, I don't think that their wisdom was markedly superior to that of the American people as a whole. And the way they were willing to use intimidation and force to get their way suggests that they recognized they couldn't get their way democratically. And indeed, FDR would go on to win in a landslide in the 1936 election. That makes me skeptical of the proposal that the conditions needed for armed resistance were fulfilled. If there had been the certain grave and prolonged violation of fundamental rights and all the other conditions, they wouldn't have needed a coup. Also, however fascist dictatorships may have appeared to the people in the 1920s and 1930s, we now know that they did not end well. That suggests that the condition of not provoking worse disorders was not fulfilled because fascist dictatorships produce worse disorders than the things they replaced. So I don't think the coup is justified. All right. So what can we say about the business plot from the reason perspective? Could it all have been something that General Butler just imagined or made up? That was the view advocated by the people who had been named by General Butler in his testimony. When McGuire appeared before the same congressional committee, he admitted to meeting Butler a number of times, but denied that there was any plot. J.P. Morgan said the story was perfect moonshine. And General Douglas MacArthur said that Butler's claims were the best laugh story of the year. The press took the same line. The New York Times dismissed it as a gigantic hoax and said that details are lacking to add verisimilitude to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. A statement I have to love because it's a quotation from the Gilbert and Sullivan operetta The Mikado. Time magazine similarly dismissed the idea, as did other press outlets. And is that what you think? Not in the slightest. Butler was a man of strong views, but he wasn't delusional, and he wouldn't risk his reputation by perpetrating a giant hoax against some of the most powerful men in America who could sue him into the ground for slander if he'd been making it up. Also, multiple other people confirmed Butler's story. Paul French was an independent witness who got McGuire to spill the whole plan to him, confirming Butler's story. And former Navy man, Lieutenant James E. Van Zant of the Veterans of Foreign Wars, confirmed that he also 
was approached by representatives of the business plot and asked to participate. Army Captain Samuel Glazier, who was then a commander in the Civilian Conservation Corps, testified to Congress that he also was approached by a representative of the business plot who said they wanted to build an organization and install a dictatorship in America. They told him they had $700 million at their disposal, which would be $14 billion today. What about the claims that other people made when they testified, like McGuire? When McGuire testified before Congress and denied the plot, the committee shot his story full of holes. McGuire was an ineffective witness who repeatedly said he couldn't remember key facts involving huge sums of money that would be seared into the memory of any normal 1934 citizen handling the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. He also gave implausible explanations for other transactions like, I was given this huge ginormous sum of money by this guy to invest on his behalf, but I didn't end up doing that. The committee was able to catch McGuire in multiple lies about his purpose for visiting General Butler, about his financial transactions, and about his travels. They did this using bank records, hotel records, and postcards he had sent from Europe, which very clearly indicated that he had been investigating militaristic veterans organizations there. And the committee concluded that the core of Butler's story was true. And rightly so. This was not something General Butler made up. The only question was how extensive the plot was. What about the idea that General Butler had that McGuire might be the instigator of the plot and it might just be a way for him to scam millionaires out of their money? That's possible, and there have been people who propose this, but I don't think so. First, that was just a thought General Butler had, and he ultimately concluded that the threat was serious, which is why he testified before Congress in November of 1934. Second, we don't have any testimony from anyone saying that was the case. It's just speculation. Third, based on the testimony of other people like Captain Glazier, it wasn't just McGuire who was talking about the coup. Other people were promoting it as well. So even if the original idea for the coup had been McGuire's, it would have taken on a life of its own. And people were seriously pushing it, putting lots of money on the line and putting themselves in terrible legal jeopardy and being accused of treason. But I don't think it was McGuire's idea. The people who would be really interested in such a plot were the big industrialists, and it would not have moved forward without their say-so. I think McGuire was just what he appeared to be, a low-level functionary who was simply serving higher masters that wanted to maintain plausible deniability. Let's look at the aftermath of the business plot. How did it fall apart? By November of 1934, federal investigators had caught wind that something was going on, and they subpoenaed General Butler to testify before a congressional committee. This was a precursor of the House Un-American Activities Committee, which would go on in the 1950s to be famous for hearings directed against communists. But fascists were what were being investigated here. The committee met briefly in late November of 1934 and published its hearings report on December 29th. It concluded that there was evidence sustaining General Butler's account. However, when it released the transcripts of the testimony it heard, it censored some of the most inflammatory parts, including those dealing with the names of influential people. Fortunately, those passages were later recovered, allowing us to read them in this episode. Also, despite the fact that the committee recommended further investigation— The whole matter was dropped, and no further investigation occurred. But why not? This is something that's debated. It's been speculated that FDR thought it would be too destabilizing for the country to hash through this in public. If he went after the leaders of the business plot, it could bring about a coup involving business and military leaders. So the speculation goes that Roosevelt may have wanted the whole thing swept under the rug. As it was, the congressional hearings put the leaders on notice that the government was wise to their plans and they should not pursue them further. And as a member of the upper class and also as the president, Roosevelt might have privately put pressure on the plot's leaders and warned them what would happen if they started making moves against him. What happened to General Butler afterward? After the matter was dropped, Smedley Butler was publicly hung out to dry. 
But feisty guy that he was, he defended himself and called a press conference to explain himself to the public. And since it was distributed in the newsreels of the day, we can hear what he had to say in his own voice. I appeared before the Congressional Committee, the highest representation of the American people under subpoena to tell what I knew of activities, which I believe might lead to an attempt to set up a fascist dictatorship. The plan as outlined to me was to form an organization of veterans to use as a bluff or as a club at least to intimidate the government and break down our democratic institutions. The upshot of the whole thing was that I was supposed to lead an organization of 500,000 men which would be able to take over the functions of government. I talked with an investigator for this committee who came to me with a subpoena on Sunday, November 18th. He told me they had unearthed Evidence linking my name with several such veteran organizations. As it then seemed to me to be getting serious, I felt it was my duty to tell all I knew of such activities to this committee. My main interest in all this is to preserve our democratic institution. I want to retain the right to vote, the right to speak freely, and the right to write. If we maintain these basic principles, our democracy is safe. No dictatorship can exist with suffrage, freedom of speech, and press. So Butler did not back down from his story. He also became a strong advocate of keeping America out of foreign wars, arguing that we should only use military force to defend the homeland. Based on his time in the Marine Corps, he was convinced that foreign wars needlessly spent the lives of American men to protect business interests. So he wrote a famous book called War is a Racket, in which he criticized such ventures, some of which he viewed as literal blood-for-oil deals since he had been on military expeditions to protect American oil interests. He died in 1940, before the outbreak of World War II, and it's been suggested that he would have supported that war given the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which, even though Hawaii wasn't a state yet, it was an American territory. What happened to Gerald Maguire and the leaders of the business plot? Maguire died four months after the committee met on March 25th, 1935. He was only 37 years old at the time, and you might suspect foul play, you know, to keep him quiet in case the matter was revived and prosecutors could flip him to testify against the higher-ups, a common prosecutorial tactic. That's certainly something I've wondered about, but his doctor attributed his death to complications from pneumonia, so natural causes, although the doctor acknowledged that the allegations against McGuire and the resulting stress they put on him may have weakened his condition. Of course, his doctor could have been bribed or intimidated into saying he died of pneumonia, but I don't have evidence for that. The others involved were never prosecuted, though some spent substantial amounts of time out of the country, and it's been suggested they did that, they went overseas, to let things blow over and for the controversy to die down so they wouldn't be prosecuted when they came back. And what about the American Liberty League that had been founded? It continued to oppose FDR and his New Deal policies. However, after he won re-election in a landslide, the League lost influence and went out of business in 1940. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the business plot? I think we dodged a bullet. I think that the business plot was real and serious. The situation was so explosive in 1934 that there was a chance the coup plotters could have succeeded and we could have had a fascist dictatorship in America. That also could have profoundly influenced the course of history. I mean, just imagine what might have happened in World War II with a fascist America on the scene. But fortunately, the coup plotters didn't count on what a patriot Smedley Butler was. He was willing to come forward, blow the whistle on the plot, and it never came to pass. Thank God. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners on this? We'll have a link to Jules Archer's book, The Plot to Seize the White House, also articles on the business plot and Smedley Butler, the congressional report 
on the business plot, articles on what a dictator is, what fascism is, the difference between a recession and a depression, the idea of a Roosevelt dictatorship, also the newsreel of the 1933 assassination attempt that we heard before, an article on Giuseppe Zangara, the assassin, also FDR's 1933 inaugural address, the Great Depression, how FDR's policies may have extended the Depression by seven years, the Bonus Army, the American Legion, the Gold Standard, the American Liberty League, also the New York Times scoffing at the congressional report, and General Butler's press conference newsreel. All right. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback, which I said before was going to be on our recent episode on when the Gospels were written. Our first feedback comes from Ana Lucia on YouTube, who writes, I read a work on the new dating of the Gospels, which uses Jean Carmignac's La Naissance des Evangiles Synoptiques. He claims there is evidence that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Hebrew. He goes to compare the Greek with the Hebrew and notices that the Greek is a translation of Hebrew according to the translation rules of the time. Unfortunately, Carmen Yak's work is only found in French. I wonder if Jimmy's familiar with the work and what he thinks of their work. I am familiar with John Carmignac's book, and it actually is available in English. It, the English title is The Birth of the Gospels, or The Birth of the Synoptic Gospels. And it came out, uh, I think, in the 90s, which was when I bought it. It's out of print today, and I checked Amazon, and wow, like <laughs> a lot of small-run scholarly books, it It'll it'll run you nine hundred dollars to get the one they have on Amazon, but it is in English, and so you may be able to find it that way. I am interested in the idea that there was a, a Hebrew or Aramaic version of Matthew early on that we don't have anymore, but I don't think the kinds of arguments that Carmignac and others, like the author of the Hebrew Matthew, propose, are are convincing because. I think the author of Matthew was Jewish. I mean, he's clearly writing for Jewish Christians. And I think he did probably know he and think in Aramaic. And so that's going to result in his Greek taking on an Aramaic flavor. And so it's really hard to distinguish between something that was written in Aramaic and translated into Greek versus something that was thought in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. I mean, yes, I agree there's an Aramaic background behind this, but is it a written document or is it just what he's thinking before he thinks, how do I say this in Greek? Also, lots of the stuff in the Gospels is quotations from Jesus and other people in first century Palestine, and they are quotations from Aramaic. So merely showing that there's an Aramaic background or Hebrew background to this doesn't show that there was a written version of the Gospel of Matthew in that language, although it certainly was translated into those languages later. And I'm interested in the idea that when he dashed off a Greek version, Matthew may have also dashed off a Hebrew version or an Aramaic version, but I don't have proof of those things at this point. Anthony F. on YouTube writes, really love the episode. Since I'm eventually writing my thesis on the relationship between Mark and Matthew, essentially why an eyewitness would use a non-eyewitness as his primary source, It's the Gospel of Peter. It was really great to hear all of your research, and it gave me a few more resources to look into. One comment, on one level, it can seem open and shut for Matthew to be using Luke as a source, like you mentioned in the show. Matthew at least seems to be rearranging the teachings into topical settings, specifically five of them mirroring the Torah, which whereas Luke has them interspersed. But I would still argue that Luke could have written post-Matthew with two things. One, Matthew keeps a similar order to Mark, just inserting more sections of teaching, shortening some unnecessary information, expanding where he needed to re-emphasize Peter's role. He is adding flesh to Mark's skeleton, and you figure there'd be more moving around of things if he was basing it on both Mark and Luke. Two, inasmuch as many, seems that more than one gospel exists, have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you. That's from Luke 1, 1. Luke, having the various teachings out of order, might be him rearranging them chronologically. Mark records Peter's sermon notes, not chronological. Matthew fleshed out of order Mark to tell people why to listen to this Gentile accommodating Peter from the Council of Jerusalem. 
and then Luke gives the account in order, chronologically. Obviously just a theory, but it does make it a little less open and shut about the order. So there's several interesting things there, and good luck on your thesis. There's a, it's a fascinating topic. In terms of the arguments you propose for Luke writing before Matthew, I would respond as follows. With regard to the first one, that you would expect Matthew to change the order of Mark more if he were using both Mark and Luke. I don't, I don't think that is true if you assume that Mark is the primary document that Matthew is working with. He has this he has this straightforward narrative in Mark. He uses 90% of it if you if you you know do the statistics. He he just plows through Mark only making very slight adjustments. But then what he takes from Luke is primarily, not exclusively, but primarily teachings. And we know he's reorganizing teachings into the big speeches in Matthew. So I think what he did was he used Mark as the backbone of his gospel and then cherry-picked Luke for the teachings he wanted to include, which of course are not in Luke's order because he's arranging them topically instead. In terms of the preface of Luke, where he refers to many people having done prior accounts that are somewhat similar to what he's doing. Well, many, and this is something that uh, Richard Baucom talks about, I believe, in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Many is kind of a rhetorical flourish. You can't really press that to say, uh, you can say at least one that Luke is aware of, but, you know, people often will use a plural sounding thing or indicate multiples like I've heard people say when really I've heard one person say and they did the same kind of thing in Greek so this could be a rhetorical many and it doesn't have to include what we consider gospels it could include other narratives of Jesus that weren't as ambitious as a gospel or it could include lost gospels so I don't think that that's strong evidence of Matthew coming before Luke in terms of him saying he wants to write an orderly account, this is something uh, Baucom definitely does talk about in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. That doesn't appear to be a chronological order. And I don't recall if Baucom makes this point, but you can show that in Luke's travel narrative, which starts very early on in the gospel and then concludes with Jesus getting to Jerusalem. It's his, the travel narrative is Luke's account of Jesus's final journey, and it just goes chapter after chapter after chapter. This is not material that's in chronological order. This is material that Luke has put together to form the travel narrative, but we really don't know when in Jesus's ministry these things occurred. So it's it it only takes a few days to get from Jerusalem uh, to get from Galilee to Jerusalem and this is too much stuff to be remembered in chronological order all squeezed into that journey. So Luke doesn't appear to be putting the gospel into what we would think of as a chronological order. Instead, he's putting it in good literary order. Because one of the things that you want in a literary biography is you want, among other things, where this person, you know, the subject of your biography, where this person came from. How did they grow up? What was their family like? Were there signs that they would play such a great role in the course of events? And then also, how did, how did, what happened at the end of their life? And, you know, what happened afterwards? What was their legacy? Well, Mark's gospel didn't have those things. I think because it was a type, or at least this is the current idea I'm exploring, that Mark is actually a collection of notes, what was called in the ancient world a hepomnemata, that was not meant to serve as a complete gospel. It was meant to be the basis of something in greater literary order, which Luke then did by supplying the infancy and resurrection narratives in his gospel. And Matthew did the same thing, which is the point that Papias makes in his discussion of how Mark didn't write an orderly account, meaning a proper literary order, but Matthew did. And so it's not just Luke that did an orderly account. Matthew did as well. Okay. So those are some thoughts for you. Sam D. wrote on YouTube, Great episode. Do you have any other thoughts on the ending of the Gospel of Mark? It seems to me that whoever wrote it thought the resurrection and ascension was important enough to be included in it, and the basic elements of the story match up with the other Gospels. So that would mo most likely make it historical. What do you think? 
Well, I agree. So he, Sam is talking about the last 12 verses of Mark, Mark 9 through 20. And these are thought to have not been part of the original ending of Mark. It They're in a different style. They don't appear in some of the older ban- manuscripts. And it looks like this is a later ending, precisely because Mark did not produce a gospel in good literary order. It, it The versions we have of it break off very suddenly at verse 8. And so it was felt that there was a need to give it an ending. And that ending is largely composed of material taken from the other Gospels. You've got references to to Matthew and Luke and John and even Acts in that ending. And so I think, yes, it draws on accurate historical traditions. So, you know, I, I don't have a problem, I, you know, with, with the content of it. I think it is historically accurate. The more interesting question to me is, was there an original lost ending and if so, how did it get lost? And we'll, we may do a future episode just on the ending of Mark's gospel because there's so much interesting stuff there. But as I mentioned, my current theory that I'm exploring is that there was not an ending because Mark was just originally meant to be a collection of notes and not a polished literary work. Okay. Anti387 on YouTube writes, I really disagree when it comes to Mark and priority. I think the arguments for Matthew's priority are much stronger. Well, I appreciate that, and you're welcome to disagree. I never expect anybody to agree with me. I can say that I came to the conclusion of Mark and Priority slowly and carefully, and the arguments for Mathean Priority are principally exterior. That's external evidence. It's quotations from later Christian writers saying Matthew wrote first. And I think that can be explained by the fact that Matthew is the most Jewish gospel. And so you would think, well, it's the most Jewish. It should be first. On the other hand, when we look at the original, the earliest statement we have about the composition of the gospels, which is Papias's statement from the early second century, he implies Mark is first and that Matthew is later than Mark. Also, it's and I encourage you to go to my treatment of the synoptic problem on jimmyakin.com because I lay out the reasons why I think it doesn't make any sense to assume Methayan priority because the anxi- the authors in the ancient world wrote their books a certain way. They used certain compositional practices. And if you assume that Mark wrote first and Matthew modified Mark, it fits with ancient compositional practices. If you assume the reverse, that that Matthew wrote first and Mark modified Matthew and or Luke, it makes absolutely no sense in terms of ancient compositional practices. It breaks all kinds of things, and it forces Mark to do amazingly illogical things, like when space is at a premium in a gospel, especially if you're writing the shortest of the gospels, you suddenly get more verbose and tell the same story using more words that could be considered just fluff. And similarly, throwing out hugely important things like the Lord's Prayer and most of Jesus's teachings in favor of including an extra story about a blind man getting healed, that when you already have a story about a blind man getting healed. If you'd like to read more about that, there's a dissertation by a gentleman named Richard Derenbacher that you can look up. It's online, and it deals with ancient compositional practices, and it's really good. But for a simplified version of the arguments, check out the synoptic problem at jimmyakin.com. Just Google synoptic problem Jimmy Aiken. Robert L. writes on YouTube, I also recommend to all the late Dennis Barton's churchinhistory.org. The Synoptic Problem, The Gospels Are Historical. The site is being maintained after Mr. Barton's passing. Barton, following the life work of Father Bernard Orchard, OSB, actually has a different sequence than Jimmy, namely the Clementine theory, naming Matthew wrote first in Hebrew slash Aramaic, then Luke actually wrote before Mark, used Matthew as a big source. Mark's gospel was the result of Peter's preaching to a group of Roman God-fearers, circa 1965, not 1965, 65, with both the already written Peter goes back and forth between the two scrolls, adding in quick personal memories. First of all, I want to say I'm sorry to hear that Dennis Barton has passed. I had an email correspondence with Dennis Barton. He was always really nice. I 
I had not heard that of his passing, but I thank you for letting me know. I am aware of Dennis Barton's support of Bernard Orcher's views, which is sometimes labeled the fourfold gospel theory, or Dennis called it the Clementine theory based on the idea that St. Clement of Alexandria supports it in a particular quotation. That is not to be taken as read. Actually, it looks like Clement is not saying what he's being taken to say when you study the original Greek. I wrote a critique of the view that Dennis and Bernard Orchard and David Allen Black also supported, which is basically Matthew wrote first, then Luke, then Mark fused the two, basing his fusion off of Peter reading sermons, giving sermons where he was switching back and forth between the scroll that had Matthew and the scroll that had Luke. And there's a bunch of problems with that, which we'll have a link to. It, it'll be in the show notes for Jimmy's article on the Orchard Hypothesis. I Now, Bernard Orchard passed on some time ago, so I couldn't ever get his feedback. I did, you know, invite Dennis's feedback, and he was very gracious, although I don't think he was able to overcome the arguments I proposed. I also asked David Allen Black if he would like to read it, and he declined. So I have affection for these guys, but I, I, I don't think the evidence supports their view. Joseph O. on Patreon wrote, I liked the episode, but I have one criticism. You didn't really address whether the Gospels were written in their entirety at the given dates. The early dates you favor are definitely realistic for the first versions of the Gospels, but the various edits, expansions, and redactions that are likely present in the Gospels are probably dated much later. I would love to hear your opinion on where the earliest drafts of Mark ended. I've heard everything from there being a few verses that have a later date to the whole resurrection narrative. My thanks to you guys, as always, for an amazing podcast. Thank you, Joseph. I, I think I've kind of covered in a short form my views on the ending of Mark. So I think I've given you uh, what you were looking for there. In terms of the idea that there's this there are these sort of proto editions of the Gospels that then later get dramatic expansions and redactions, that theory was supported by form criticism where the idea was what the early Christians were originally passing down were these gospel traditions in oral form that then developed and grew over a long period of time, and there were multiple editions of the gospels, and I frankly don't buy that. If that had been the case, that there were multiple editions of the gospels early on, we should see more diversity than we do in the manuscripts that survived. Because once you release a gospel, it's going to get read and copied among Jesus's followers. And so if there was like a, a proto-Matthew that, let's say, had only two-thirds of what our Matthew today does, we should have some manuscripts that reflect proto-Matthew that are only two-thirds as long as the one we have today, and we don't, um, with at least the four gospels. It doesn't look like, with with one exception that's only possible, which is John, and it would have just been the addition of one or two chapters to John, there's no real evidence for that kind of revision going on. I think that the idea there were multiple changes and redactions is a product of the form-critical assumptions that the Gospels had to form over a long period of time, and I don't think that's the case. I Also, one reason is books were incredibly expensive in the ancient world. You didn't just sit down and say, hey, let's write a book and add some new stuff to it, typically. I mean, sometimes that did happen, but then it's reflected in the manuscript evidence, and we don't have that for the four Gospels. So I think the Gospels were large, are largely in the form that they had when they were originally released, even John, although I understand there is an argument for why maybe the last chapter of John was added. So I think there were, you know, as scribes did things, there were minor additions that happened, you know, over time that show up in some manuscripts, but not others. Um, but I, well, allowing scholars to try to deduce what was the original form, but I don't think there were substantial ones. I think we'd have different evidence than we do. And I don't say that out of a kind of bias of wanting to say, oh, there was only one original edition and there weren't later substantial modifications. I actually think there is a book in the New Testament that we do have manuscript evidence for a second edition, and that's the book of Acts, 
We have two versions of the book of Acts. One of them is notably longer than the other. And one hypothesis is that Luke came out with an original edition of Acts, and then he did a revised edition of Acts, and both of them got copied, and that's why we have these two different versions of Acts. So that's a possibility. I just don't think the manuscript evidence is there in the case of the Gospels. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. We love getting your feedback, and that's uh, some especially good scholarly feedback in this episode. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, this time we're talking about dark matter, uh, harking back to episode 83 on the case of the missing universe. And there's a new dark matter candidate. A proposal is that it's made of particles that are hexaquarks. A hexaquark would be a particle that's made out of six quarks. Now, protons and neutrons are made out of three quarks each. And protons are electrically charged. Neutrons are electrically neutral, which is why they have their name. Dark matter needs to be electrically neutral in order for it to be dark. Otherwise, it would interact with light and we'd be able to detect it by something other than gravity. And so if you have a particle made out of six quarks, there are ways it could be electrically neutral. And thus, people are proposing this as a candidate for dark matter. On the other hand, we're also going to have a link to a video about new evidence against dark matter. And this is by a, a young British astronomer, Dr. Becky, who makes very entertaining videos. And she has, you know, been taught in school, yeah, dark matter, dark matter, rah, 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 dark energy, dark energy, sis, boom, ba. <laughs> and and so she's kind of reluctant about this new evidence, but accurately says, you know, OK, so this is some evidence that would cut against the idea of dark matter being real. Maybe it is unreal. Maybe it's fully real. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. Maybe we both need to modify our theory of gravity a little bit. And there's some kind of dark matter out there. So check out her interesting video on that. Excellent. Well, we'd love to hear from you, from your, get your feedback. What are your theories about the business plot? What's your reaction to hearing about this uh, attempted fascist coup in the United States in 1934? If you, especially if you haven't heard of it before, let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or sending a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. We really do appreciate it when you share the podcast with your friends and when you write a review of the podcast and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast from, that helps us grow our community of listeners and to reach more people all the time. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken. Thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. Once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest.